Hello and welcome back to Foreign Correspondents. I'm your host, Moon Ga Young, and joining me here in the studio today is our panel of foreign journalists and an expert today. Welcome to the program. Now, climate change has emerged as one of the most pressing issues being faced by the international community in recent years, with many countries around the world already suffering from the effects of unusual and adverse weather conditions. In this week's edition of Foreign Correspondence, we sit down with our panel of journalists and an expert to talk more about how we can stop climate change through the reduction of our carbon footprint, among other measures. Now, how has climate change um, affected in your countries? Well, for example, in Germany, um, the empirical data shows that, for example, the number of excessively hot days has increased over the last decades, um, which is especially severe in urban areas in the cities because you have a lot of concrete. So that's really dangerous for vulnerable age groups like um, small children or um, older people. Also, you see that um, you know, in the south of Germany, there are the Alps, the mountains, and the glaciers are slowly melting, which has like, um, strong consequences for the rivers that depend on the mountain water. Uh, you see, in general, like longer periods of, of drought and also more flooding, and that changes, for example, also the vegetation. Right now, um, when you uh, reforest like, um, uh, forests, you would choose a different kind of trees because with the um, new conditions, actually, you have to also adapt like, the vegetation. And I think it kind of affects like, uh, almost every um, aspect of life. Maybe for some people, it's not really visible yet, but it's definitely showing. Right, we definitely feel it in, in South Korea with fine dust and everything. What about you, Kelly, in your country? Well, the United States is quite big, right? So it depends on the region. But overall, the U.S. is seeing major uh, damage because of climate change, unfortunately. Um, I looked at a report that the government publishes every year. And for 2018, there was a lot of concern about, um, you know, raised raise temperatures in the Northeast, um, sea level rise in the Northeast. In the West, particularly California, you have forest fires, um, droughts, which is a big problem, right? Because there's a lot of nature out there. Um, we've seen people die literally from the increase in forest fires. Um, there have been disputes over water because of the droughts and most of the agriculture in the United States comes from California. In the south we have problems with flooding. Um, all of this kind of culminates into you know obviously people um, passing away in natural disasters, people um, incurring all sorts of damage to their health because of smoke. Um, it's just not a good picture, and it uh, really spells out how climate change is a problem right now in the U.S., not something that's going to be a concern only a few decades from now. Absolutely. Now, uh, let's bring in experts' view. Dr. Ahn, um, now, the science of greenhouse gases, which we hear that is a problem that triggers climate change. Now, how is it a problem, and how does it trigger climate change? As the consume of the fossil fuel has increased, this makes the atmosphere of the Earth thicker, radiant heat emission decrease, and the average temperature is increased since the 20th century. Uh, Korea has some problem. Uh, the heat can go back to the space due to the thicker is atmosphere, and we call greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases is cause uh, abnormal is temperature such as uh, heat and cold waves which means climate change. Mm -hmm. right. right, as mentioned uh, previously, carbon dioxide is uh, created when burning fossil fuels and other carbon-based materials. Um, what kind of ca stories have you written or seen or read about uh, carbon dioxide and carbon reductions? Um, well, you know, in South Korea, I've written about the environment for a while now. Um, and I just did a story a couple weeks ago about how the Moon Jae-in government is investing billions basically to uh, revamp as well as build new ports in the country. And so um, Korea is actually one of the most efficient shippers in the world in terms of cargo. So the question is why would they do that, right? 
um, a big part of that investment was to um, basically reduce the amount of energy that's being used by fossil fuels when ships are anchoring. Um, so uh, a lot of people don't know this, and I didn't know it either beforehand, but actually um, a sizable amount of emissions comes from the shipping industry. Um, I think uh, the figures I saw were somewhere between 3 and 6 percent of all emissions um, come from the shipping industry. And so basically when the ship is waiting at the dock, it's burning a ton of fossil fuel, and sometimes it's waiting for days or weeks at the dock to unload. So the idea of switching that to um, an electric system or something more efficient as well as um, running these ships on more efficient fuel. So that's just one example of an environmental concern in South Korea that I've covered and how the government is kind of reacting to it. Well, um, the biggest environmental issue that I've covered in Korea is actually the misemonji, the fine dust problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting also because it shows that um, uh, climate change or uh, environmental damage can only be fought against like globally. I mean, you have a lot of... Um, fine dust emissions coming from China, from the East Coast, from the factories, uh, and the wind blows it over to South Korea. And um, there has to be also some like cooperation, collaboration to uh, counter that. And uh, you know, every spring, for example, gets really um, acute, right? Uh, people wearing masks, having to wear masks. Um, children uh, cannot go to the playground. They have to stay in because the air gets so bad. And um, I think people here really feel the um, effects of like env environmental, environmental issues. But I think the um, willingness to actually compromise in their lifestyle and to really sacrifice some things in w the way how you consume or live your life is still quite little. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, just having to check your, your phones for, you know, those gauges, fine dust level gauges on a daily basis each morning, that's a change in life that, you know, that's become our daily lives here in Korea. Uh, what policies have uh, your countries been basically campaigning for carbon reductions? I think in Germany the most efficient one was uh, to reduce the coal power plants and um, increase the renewable energy. Um, so now if you look at the uh, electricity that's generated in Germany, um, f over 40% already comes from renewable energy. So for example, solar energy, um, wind energy. And uh, that has been, I think, quite um, effective. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, Germany also basically um, did a nuclear exit. They don't produce any more nuclear energy or just, you know, um, leaving it. Like it's decreased a lot and they will stop completely very soon. On the other hand, now a lot of nuclear energy is imported from France. Um, so it's, uh, many people criticize that actually too. And when uh, you discuss like the generation of electricity in South Korea, um, many uh, activists point out to Germany both for like um, advocating uh, renewable energies but also for criticizing it. So it's really a point of, uh, yeah, it re really depends like what point of view you take. You know, speaking to your comment about South Korea, I will just say, um, because I am a reporter in Korea, right, that um, I'm quite impressed with how much the Moon government has addressed uh, the fine dust and climate change issues so far. In August, the government passed a budget that basically expanded um, the amount of funding that they'll be using to uh, basically stretch their projects further at the end of the year. But getting to to the United States, uh, it's not as good of news. Um, unfortunately, since President Trump took office in the United States, there's been this greater battle about climate change. Um, there's been a revival of climate change deniers, which Trump is arguably one of those people. Um, he's pulled out of the Paris Accord. He's worked to um, repeal regulation from the Obama administration that basically uh, limits emission standards. Um, he's increased logging on public lands. He's defunded studies of climate change. So um, on the U.S. front, and you know, the U.S. is supposedly the second highest um, emitter of um, emissions, greenhouse gases, in the world, um, according to 2015 numbers. I mean, this country is a big deal for the greater uh, movement against climate change. But 
unfortunately, since 2016, we've taken significant steps back in fighting climate change. And just to make note, um, it was President Moon Jae-in's uh, policy goals as he started his term to cut down on greenhouse gas emissions and to tackle fine dust. So that was one of his policy goals. Recently, South Korea's alpine city of Pyeongchang, where 2018 Winter Olympics was held, hosted a carbon forum, and Arirang TV was there to capture the highlights. Take a look. Pyeongchang. Here, where the entire world zoomed in for the 2018 Winter Olympics in February last year, academics, government representatives, and UN officials have gathered to discuss climate change. The 2019 Korea Carbon Forum was held to respond to climate change through future industries and to come up with solutions to create a low-carbon society. This is the third annual edition of the Korea Carbon Forum. When we hosted the PyeongChang Winter Olympics last year, we promised that we would be a low-carbon sporting event. Many programs have been introduced in that regard utilizing low-carbon technologies such as electric, hydrogen and self-driving vehicles. There is also the carbon money system where waste collected for recycling can be returned in exchange for payment. We aim to further promote these initiatives at the forum by inviting firms to speed up their development and commercialization. The annual Korea Carbon Forum, now into its third year, was held under the theme of creating a low-carbon society through future industries with a focus on the Southeast Asian region. The forum served as a platform for discussions on future industries based on new carbon-related technologies as well as ways to create a necessary framework for regional cooperations on the matter. The forum also introduced a program to promote ordinary citizens' participation in the initiative, with environmental issues not being limited to the interests of scientists, but rather every individual on the planet were seeing a deterioration in their quality of life due to global warming and pollution. State-to-state -state cooperation is also taking place as a means for countries to share their concerns on environmental issues and climate change. This year's form also established a cooperation framework to export carbon dioxide reduction technology to developing countries such as Vietnam, Nepal and Bhutan. Right, so it really goes without saying, like all of you mentioned, that the climate change is, is not only limited to one country, but it's a problem facing the entire international community. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, the Paris Climate Accord was signed on December 2015 as part of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. 195 countries signed on to the agreement to make their collective on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Despite the agreement, however, the world's carbon emissions increased at a record pace in the year 2018. Now, do you believe the Paris Climate Accord was effective at all um, and appropriate means to reduce carbon and greenhouse gases emissions have come available to all countries? Well, um, I would say um, it was not as uh, efficient or effective as I would like it to be, but uh, it brought awareness to the topic and it's something that uh, being talked about and it's kind of a reference point, this uh, Paris uh, uh, climate agreement, but um, on the other hand, the goals will not be reached. Like um, the U.S. has pulled out of that agreement, so there are many things to criticize. But after all, yeah, I think it's better than nothing. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with what Fabian said. I think um, you know, just the fact that you know, several countries in the world, some of which are heavily responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions that we're seeing on our planet. Um, come together and say that this is a priority for them. That's historic. That's great. I mean, um, there, in terms of the actual effectiveness, I mean, I don't know. I think the program is still building, if I'm correct, right? Like, I believe 
up until 2020 at least. They're still um, trying to corral funds to help developing countries kind of create mitigation programs and things like that. So um, in terms of like the actual measurable reduction in greenhouse gases or um, PM 2.5 fine dust, I honestly don't know. Um, but I think, it, you know, as a planet, we do need that kind of cohesion. And it is unfortunate that countries, uh, not even countries, that the United States pulled out of this because, um, as I mentioned before, they are the second highest um, greenhouse gas emitter. And it calls into question, you know, whether other countries hold any responsibility to the Paris Accord mm -hmm. after the fact. Europe and U.S. to a certain extent demonstrated some progress in reducing their carbon emissions to to a certain period, I would say. Um, critics say this was only achieved by outsourcing pollution to less developed countries. Do you believe advanced economies of the world have a greater responsibility to reduce their carbon footprint re compared to less developed countries? Well, I would definitely agree. So, um, you know, if you look at how societies or countries develop, you have the industrialization period, um, you reach a certain amount of wealth, and then you are saturated. And for example, I've been reporting on environmental issues in India. They also undertake some actions, but they basically say, uh, first, we need to get the people out of poverty. And that's understandable. It's like, um, for example, like the, the Western world or the, the developed nations have celebrated a party and then now the others want to join and yeah. you say, no, it's too late. Now you have to um, focus on environmental issues. I can understand if for countries, let's say in Africa, um, environmental issues is not the first uh, priority. So um, I think, um, let's say Europe or the US should actually lead the way. They should make some sacrifices mm -hmm. now. Decision by the United States to withdraw from the Paris Agreement on climate change is a major disappointment for global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promote international security. Every single one of the signatories to the Paris Climate Accord lags behind America in overall emissions reductions. Who would think that is possible? For this reason, in my first year in office, I withdrew the United States from the unfair, ineffective, and very, very expensive Paris Climate Accord. So how do you think uh, the U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord would affect other members, other signatories of the Paris Climate Accord to follow through with their pledges? I mean, I've been encouraged by the fact that um, several countries have come forward and say that they are continuing with the plan. But of course, if the United States pulls out, it sets this precedent that uh, you can sign a deal and you know have it in the press and then back out of it shortly thereafter. Um, Again, it's discouraging because the United States is so responsible um, for a high portion of greenhouse gas emissions. And also, the United States is an extremely wealthy country that very much has the power and the ability to implement better lifestyles, to regulate its corporations, industries, um, and it just doesn't. So, I mean, if the United States is cutting corners in this way, who's to say that China won't as well or you know, other major countries? It just doesn't seem like it's really fair um, granted, you know, like, should we care about a fairness principle when the planet is literally dying? Mm -hmm. Probably not, but it, it doesn't send a good message by any means. But let me briefly add, I was like super disappointed by it because actually the Paris Accord is like the lowest consensus that you can have. It's basically like self-imposed goals and if you don't reach those goals, I mean, there's de facto almost no punishment, so there's actually not not any real consequences. And if the US can, cannot even agree to, to that kind of um, low consensus, that uh, to me shows that uh, the President Trump does not really believe in climate change. Right, at the bare minimum is the Paris Climate Accord. Let's now shift gears and talk about some of the things that the ordinary citizens, the average citizens can do to stop or to slow down climate change. Alongside carbon dioxide emissions, plastic waste has also been identified as one of the world's most problematic contributors to pollution, with plastic pollution being one of the key factors in global warming, efforts are being made to reduce the amount of plastic waste. Now, delivery foods and other delivery services in South Korea, of course, South Korea is known for that, uh, leading to use of many most disposable containers and whatnot. However, many small business owners are struggling to manage the cost of going plastic-free and avoiding the use of disposable products. 
Do you believe that re regulating the use of plastic uh, and other disposable containers could be difficult and costly for small business owners? Possibly, yes, but I think then there also need, need to be some kind of regulations. Yeah, for takeout food, um, it's, um, we're not really used to um, eating, like, let's say, for example, like the, many of the um, Chinese Korean uh, stores who, who do takeout, you would get the bowl and then you would leave it um, outside of your, um, let's say, the jajangmyeon bowl and you uh, would leave out the plate after you ate it and then the delivery guy picks it up again. And that works too, right? So I think th there will always be solution. There's no excuse for, um, for um, uh, small and medium-sized um, uh, uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies to not, f not also do something to reduce plastic waste. Yeah, I mean, I can only speak to more of the Western side of this, but I have looked into, you know, is, is there any research about how much more expensive this is for small businesses and things like that? And it does seem that most of the research I saw um, does say, yes, it is more expensive for small businesses to choose more eco-friendly alternatives. Mm -hmm. But I guess the greater question here is, um, what are the morals that we want to set as a society? Do you know, um, do we want to encourage um, business management to the point where it's all about maximizing your margins? Or do we want to um, implement some kind of standard in society where um, small businesses have a responsibility to reduce harm? right, to the environment. So I guess um, even though it might be, say, 40% more expensive for a um, coffee shop in America to choose biodegradable alternatives, uh, maybe uh, they have that ethical responsibility to themselves and also the environment. So I think a lot of this um, stems from these greater questions we have to ask ourselves as a society, a global society, about um, what we owe the planet and each other and um, how can we, you know, basically reform how we regulate businesses to match those kind of moral priorities? And actually, if a company decides to go eco-friendly, then um, it might attract additional customers, right? Because as a consumer, um, you might feel also better for, like, let's say, buying clothes at a store that uh, produces them more in a sustainable way than the big chain. Uh, which might be a little cheaper, but um, yeah, you might also feel like mm -hmm. guilty for buying there. Mm -hmm. And there are increasing number of those who feel that way, thankfully. Yeah. Environmental issues such as soil contamination and microplastics in the world's oceans have become serious social concerns. Our products are 100% biodegradable, which means they can be safely buried without causing any soil contamination. Since environmental issues are becoming a growing social concern, our role is to provide goods that people can consume without harming the environment. So that is a... Uh really optimistic sign, but even if efforts to reduce greenhouse gases and plastic succeed, it won't be possible to eliminate waste altogether. And that is why some firms and environmental groups have found new ways to utilize waste for various purposes. Now, are there any innovative, eco-friendly, recycled, ways, uh, friendly products out there that left a particularly strong impression on you? Um, something that I saw in Korea, which I enjoy, is at my local Jumin Center, they have these um, giant tanks where you can actually fill up your own water containers. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a lot of South Korean people don't drink tap water, even though um, it tests as safe, uh, myself included. Um, so I um, think that's a really interesting thing that communities can provide. Um, it brings down costs for families, but also, um, obviously, it reduces the amount of used plastic. Also, when I was in Thailand, I noticed that there's actually um, a little bit of a renaissance of these um, places that sell shampoo or soap or things like that, where you bring your own container and you get a refill. So the kind of um, supporting the zero waste uh, trend, if you will, and I think those things are good and we need to see more of them for sure. Why don't we turn to our expert? So uh, what are some actions that the average citizens or ordinary people like ourselves could do to stop climate change? We have established the climate change action plan for the recycling. We know that it's uh, some solid waste, speed up underground water, contamination, and also we will make effort to collecting the, uh, the 
bottle. It's a very serious problem for uh, microplastic. In Xi, uh, for example, Gangwon province, we starting to cover the money. Right, so giving yeah. it back to the people yeah, yeah. for collecting plastic bottles. Yeah, collect bottles. the bottle. Right, right. Yeah. So um, that's something that we average citizens can take part yes, in. Yes, right. Right. My favorite time of uh, the episode, your headlines of the day in, um, for preventing climate change, a message to the government, regulators, the people, Fabian. We have to take action now before it gets too late. Um, I would say climate change, a uh, major overhaul on industry is ne needed or necessary. All right. Well, I think we agree on the fact that we need to take action before it's too late is the message to the regulators, the people, to everyone um, with regards to climate change. Well, that is a wrap for our discussion this week on climate change and the various countermeasures being devised to reduce our carbon footprint and waste production. We will be back next week for another discussion on the latest issues making headlines, so don't forget to tune in then. Thank you for watching and bye-bye.